All right, it's top of the hour. Aloha, my name is Annette Lynch. I, my, I'm the Program Manager with Maui Economic Development Board, and it's my delight to welcome you to Maui Tech Ohana. And just before we get started, I'm going to take you through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you want to um, share your organization name as well as your name, you can rename yourself, similar to how I'm set up with uh, my name and my organization. Then we get to know a little bit more about who's in the group. Please stay muted uh, if we call upon you to speak and there'll be breakout sessions. You can unmute yourself and um, mute and unmute. When you're in breakouts, it's, there's sometimes a dead silence when people are like, who's going to go first or who's going to go next? Pass the mic. So it's easy just to keep the conversation flowing and I'll demonstrate that a little bit shortly. This presentation is being recorded, we often get asked, and it will be available after the presentation. Do give us a time, so we'll have it, we'll probably have that ready for you tomorrow, uh, not tonight. Thank you. And today we're going to um, go through a couple of introductions, and then we're going to have a breakout. That's an opportunity to network with members participating here tonight. And we've got a little question to help um, break the ice with that conversation. Then we'll have our guest speak, Omar Sultan, speaking. Then afterwards, another breakout session to discuss a little bit of what you heard and learned through the evening. And we also have a prize drawing, so please make sure you stay through the end and uh, we should finish up around 6.30. All right, I'm gonna pass the mic to Frank Drago, Jr. Frank? You're muted. That's a story of my life. <laughs> For some people, it's a blessing. So there you go. <laughs> hey, como mai? I'm Frank Durego Jr., Director of Business Development Projects at Maui Economic Development Board. On behalf of our President and CEO, Leslie Wilkins, I would like to welcome everyone to Tech Ohana this evening. Uh, Leslie sends her best wishes and says, Kalamai, her regrets uh, for not uh, being here this evening. Uh, Maui Tech Ohana uh, provides everyone interested in Maui County's tech industry with unique learning experiences and networking opportunities. And you're going to have that experience tonight with our very eminent guest speaker. MEDB also offers one in one business assistance and other programs and services that equip our small business community with the knowledge and skills to succeed. Our mission is to help nurture innovation in business education and within the community to build prosperity for all our residents. We'd like to thank our partners of the County of Maui and the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation for supporting this effort. So now I'd like to pass the mic back over to Annette who will take you through the uh, breakout uh, our first breakout this evening and uh, have a good conversation. Mahalo, Annette. Thank you, Frank. So uh, we're going to go into a breakout. Um, I am probably going to, we're just going to have uh, three rooms to uh, have a, a good conversation between five to six people. Um, let me just finish those up. But what, what I want you to talk about, introduce yourself and talk about what you are currently doing, what you're currently working on and how it relates to tonight's topic about innovation and the role of technology in the community. Good, thank you, Annette. Uh, we had a great conversation. So um, uh, I hope everybody else did as well. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Omar Sultan. I think a lot of you are familiar with him, uh, but I just, uh, you know, I just want to go through a little bit of his bio. I don't want to steal his thunder in terms of uh, him talking about himself and uh, his journey in tech and, you know, what he's seeing on the horizon. But um, all the things in his bio are very, very true about the man and the person that I know. Um, he's an investor, he's a mentor, he's a community builder. He believes in entrepreneurship. He believes innovation is the key for a better future for our world. I think those are great values. They're based in who he is as a person. Uh, I think what you might not know is that uh, Omar is internationally recognized uh, as a thought leader in building innovation communities uh, through entrepreneurship and education. Um, he's the founder of uh, 
and co-founder and managing partner of uh, Sultan Ventures, uh, which is a boutique venture investment firm. It's nationally recognized and, and, and award-winning. Uh, it, it's nationally recognized and award-winning Accelerate programs include Accelerate UH, which was ranked one of the top 30 accelerators in the country. That's quite an achievement. And uh, um, his recent uh, Accelerate Youth is a youth accelerator program. And also they've started a nonprofit, which was in the, uh, which is Accelerate X, which is dedicated to the same values here, but, you know, is an attempt to serve the community even more directly through, through the nonprofit. So um, he's been named uh, one of Hawaii's Business Magazine's 20 for the next 20 and Pacific Business News is 40 under 40. Uh, Omar, along with his brother Tarek, has been recognized as the Hawaii Venture Capital Association's Investor of the Year and by the U.S. Uh, Small Business Administration, the SBA, uh, the State of Hawaii's Small Business Investors of the Year. Uh, oh, no, as Business Advocates for Innovation. I'm sorry. He was uh, recognized by Hawaii Venture Capital Association as Investors for the Year. Sorry about that. So for over a decade, uh, uh, Omar and Sultan Ventures have driven innovation forward by creating on-ramps to entrepreneurship and championing visionary entrepreneurs who are improving the way we live and work. But to, to, to give you a little bit more insight into Omar, in the depths of the pandemic, a real living symbol of Omar's community spirit approach to uh, venture capital and the development of a Hawaiian style uh, business ecosystem, and I use that word Hawaiian style, not in sort of a, a catchy phrase, but really based in, in Hawaiian values. Uh, he was very close to Pono Shim, um, and I think he learned a lot from Pono. Um, so, you know, the, the thing that he created and designed and implemented and ran with state-funded uh, money was uh, called uh, Aloha Connects Innovation. And this program assisted displaced workers affected by COVID-19 to get uh, upskilled, reskilled, and cross-skilled in the more resilient uh, emerging industries and innovation sectors. On a very more personal note, uh, I don't think I've met a person uh, with more intelligence, more integrity, uh, more drive, and more aloha for our community who exists in the innovation and venture capital space than Omar Sultan. He's a good friend of mine. I've learned to very deeply respect and love the man. He's a he's a basically a really good person. And uh, we at MEDB are pleased to introduce our partner and very, very dear friend, Omar Sultan. Now, here's your chance to prove me wrong. Okay, there we go. <laughs> you know I had to say something like that right in the process. Yeah. We can't hear you. Omar, you're on mute. Okay, double muted. Um, how's that? Um, I really appreciate it, Frank. Mahalo for that introduction. Very, very kind words. Um, and I appreciate having the opportunity to connect with all of you um, who are doing all the great things that you we're supposed to share at the beginning of the conversation. Um, you know, rule number one is show up. Uh, hopefully, for rule number two for Zoom is unmute and um, and and connect um, because it really gives us an opportunity, even though we're physically distanced, to create those uh, bridges, relationships, connections that are necessary in order in order for us to really kind of get Hawaii where we want to see it going. Right? Um, it's a continuous journey. It's 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 always going to be happening. Um, but step step one is showing up. Step two is unmuting and uh, and sharing your story, right? So that we get to know you a little bit better. Uh, as for me, I'm going to go through a few slides. Some of you have probably seen this. I recognize um, many of the names that are on the call. Um, I tried very last second to add some slides based on just my group uh, sharing. Um, so to make it a little bit more... Um, relevant to the things that they're working on or trying to work on. 
Um, for me, my background has been all over the place, uh, truly, right? So I was born in Australia. I left when I was five. Um, along the way, my, my family going, well, my parents and my sister, uh, my, my younger brother was still floating around in the cosmos. Um, you know, we had a stopover in Egypt because both my parents are Egyptian, their parents are Egyptian, etc. cetera. Um, so along the way to the U.S., this is Frank said, share personal stories. So you get to hear all the fun stuff along the way as they were, you know, selling and their home, my parents selling their home in Australia and getting ready for the move to the States. Um, beautiful coasts of New Jersey. I, uh, I was staying with my grandparents in Egypt. And so when I was about five or six, I guess I decided I didn't want to eat dinner anymore. And the best way to get out of eating dinner was to leave the dinner table, open the door, run outside the door, run down three flights of stairs out to, uh, and across the street. And halfway across the street, I got run over by a bus going about 40 miles an hour. My poor sister, who was running behind me, uh, chasing me, got to see the whole thing. She's older than I am, so she vividly uh, remembers that uh, that encounter. I don't really remember much of it at all. Anyway, eventually, so that's a personal story uh, on my side. Um, no broken bones. Uh, maybe there's been long-term brain damage. It's hard to tell. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> um, but thankfully, yeah, I, I survived and... Uh, eventually landed here in Hawaii about 18 years ago. So I've been in Hawaii for 18 years. Um, it was my sister that prompted me to move out here. She is an MD, PhD, and she came out here to do her residency in OBGYN at Kapiolani. I, at the time, was um, working in Boston, taking classes at Harvard and working in the tech sector and um, decided I'm tired of the Boston winters. So I'm going to move out to Hawaii. And so true to my nature at times, um, not always, I decided on Friday I was going to quit my job. On Saturday, I called my boss. On Sunday, I packed up my apartment. On Monday, I bought a plane ticket. Tuesday, I drove my stuff down to my parents for temporary storage. And I flew out here on Wednesday. And I had never been out to Hawaii. I have, didn't have any connections in Hawaii. Um, and my sister wasn't even out here yet. I moved up, out a full month and a half before her. And I have, haven't looked back since. So my sister completed her residency, got recruited to Stanford, um, had a dual faculty appointment over there. My brother eventually moved out. Um, my parents eventually moved out. The entire immediate family came to Hawaii and made Oahu uh, their home. Uh, even though my sister left, my brother and I decided to stay and my parents were retired. So they just split time between the two places. And we have never looked back since. Hawaii is the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my entire life. Uh, I've lived all around the world. And it is without a doubt home for me, for my brother and my sister. Uh, I was going to say my parents when my dad recently passed away. Um, but for my parents as well, it, it's very much home. In fact, um, my parents say that it reminds them of Egypt when they were growing up, uh, which obviously is very different than what Egypt looks like today. Um, so that's a little about me and personal side. Work-wise, uh, undergraduate degree in finance. I didn't want to go the investment banking route like all of my classmates did. So instead, I thought uh, technology would be more fun, more dynamic. And so I taught myself how to code. I started working, my first job was at, I don't know if you guys know or remember, well, some of you not pointing any fingers, Frank, or a little bit of an older generation, right? So EDS I, is a huge competitor to IBM, right? Uh, was it Ross Perot is the one that uh, founded it? Um, so my first job out of college in the tech industry was EDS. And I had to, they had this internal like database and they wanted to convert it. This is Back in like, I'm gonna age myself here, right? 98, 99. Uh, they wanted to convert this very internal like client server database system into something that was web-based. And so here I am just freshly taught myself how to code and how to do like database stuff. And that was my job. Um, it was an awesome job. I really enjoyed it. It was a great team. Um, I'm not shy or embarrassed to share that I'm told... Besides my 
great interviewing skills. Uh, that one of the reasons why I was hired was because my manager's manager, when she walked in the room, kind of old fashioned, I stood up, right? Um, Cause she walked in the room and I stood up to greet her. And uh, I guess that closed the deal for her. My manager told me afterwards um, a few weeks in, or a few months into my hiring that that was really kind of the, the thing that sealed the deal for me. So you know, manners matter uh, um, always, at least in my, in my book. Um, so I continued in the tech industry for the next, I don't know, uh, decade, maybe 12 years. Um, continuing to hone my skills, continuing to do object oriented, like, um, language development, continuing doing the database architecture stuff, eventually becoming pretty deeply, um, experienced on the database side of things, as well as like the web development side. Um, one of the big projects that I worked on as both, uh, the manager of the project overseeing a team, as well as, um, actually writing code myself because uh this is recorded so i'll be sensitive in how i say it um i guess the owner of the company was billing for 10 people but there was only five people on the project so uh, many of us wore dual hats right um and so i got even more entrenched into the into the code and it was really fun like we were doing things that weren't being done at the time again kind of dating um, where we were developing radiology imaging systems, electronic medical records, second consultation um, software. So um, people who were in foreign countries, instead of flying to, um, to see a doctor, they could send their entire medical records, right? X-rays, their CT scans, everything. And radiologists and experts here in the U.S. at Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic could actually review all of their uh, medical records. Um, and then they could fly out with their entourage, right? But they could save that initial trip. And so we were developing things that hadn't been done. There was no Google Docs. There was no like cloud. There was none of that stuff. And yet we had to develop these, um, these features in the system that allowed for that type of functionality. And so it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was also many, many, many hours um, spent. Um, my brother says I shouldn't say this because nobody believes it, but there were honestly weeks where we like worked 140 hours a week, right? Um, which, yeah, I mean, we barely had time to shower, take a nap, and then get back to work. And of course, it didn't last, you know, that pace didn't last for a long time. But I, I distinctly remember having to fill out timesheets because we were working on this for another big company. And we were excited when we had like 95 hours to report on a, on a weekly timesheet. We're like, man, that was an easy week. Um, fast forward, come out to Hawaii. Um, I'm not doing investments just yet. I'm still very much in the tech space. I, um, my brother actually, um, wanted to go to med school. And so he started volunteering at, um, Jabsom. And, uh, the principal investigator there, very, very special person, very close friend and mentor. He's board certified in four subspecialties. Um, that for people who are not familiar is extremely rare. I'd be surprised if there's 10 people in the country that are board certified in two or three, let alone four. Um, and he was very big in genetics, right? Um, and so they were trying to construct this database so that they could collect all of this information from, um, from patients as well as their genetic information, as well as their like actual physical um, data. So this particular study was focused on early human development disorders. So you think preeclampsia, you think uh, gestational diabetes, uh, those types of things, right? And so part of the study, we were actually collecting, um, I skipped ahead, but we were collecting like the actual placentas, we were collecting cord blood, we were collecting the fetal uh, and maternal blood, et cetera, so that we could start doing these DNA uh, studies and looking at SNPs, right? Um, which is mutations on like a single, single, singular nucleotide polymorphism, right? And so there's these little mutations that happen within our DNA and that causes like certain things to happen. And so we were looking at if there is a predisposition 
for certain ethnicities and races um, to some of these uh, early human development disorders. Anyway, to rewind a little bit, my brother overheard a conversation where they were struggling creating this database. Uh, he said, hey, do you want to talk to my brother? He's pretty good at this stuff and, um, you know, he likes it. So do you want to connect with him? At the time, this PI was also chair of the OBGYN department. Welcome to how small Hawaii is. And what did I say brought me out here? My sister doing her OBGYN residency. So now my brother was volunteering in the lab that this individual, Dr. Ken Ward, was actually um, a magnet PI for Jabsom. And so what? A, I'm all over the place, but I hope you enjoy the journey. Um, he was brought into Jabsom early days, right? Kind of early days to be a magnet PI because of his specialties and because of his knowledge and because of his experience, he would be able to attract huge federal grants. And so at the time, the grant that he was running, he's no longer here in Hawaii. Uh, at the, he was one of the largest grants that Jabsom had at the time. He also was chair of the OBG1 department at Kapiolani. He was a very driven person. He is a very driven person. And my sister was under um, his the umbrella of, you know, the residency program. Anyway, connected, helped him out, ended up hiring me. Uh, I'm going to do cliff notes now. And um, created this database warehouse and database, um, these sub databases underneath this giant data warehouse that different researchers, clinicians could tap into to data mine so that they can look at all these different physical um, as well as medical and genetic different um, samples. And it was, it was a very, very, very large um, data set. And it was meant to be large because it connected to other medical schools across the country so that now you could combine all of this information so along the way, um, yes, I was used to the hours that I was working in Boston and um, the classes I was taking. My brother and I decided to take it, get an MBA at Scheidler. So he did the daytime, even though he was working full time. Um, I did the nighttime. We got really into the business plan competitions, had a lot of fun with that. And that was probably one of my first exposures to this thing we call venture capital, right? Um, I met some amazingly awesome people. We had a really good run in terms of the different business plans and the competitions that we in were, were in. I think we're still the winningest, if that's a real term. Um, like MBA team from all the different competitions that we um, that we were invited to, and uh, I really liked the venture sort of industry. Right, I really started get to get a better understanding of the potentials um, that it can unleash, right? and the good that um, it can create. And so I was I was in. Right. And so I started to get more and more involved in it. Um, I, I'm one of my, well, he's chair of our board, Barry Weinman. He's uh, ex Silicon Valley VC. If there's ever such a thing, he's super old, old school, it has nothing to do with his age. I just mean that he has been in the Valley for over 35 years. He knows everybody, everybody. Um, and so when you hear of all these like big VC funds like Sequoia or Kleiner Perkins, et cetera, like he knew the original founders, he knew the first funds that they created. He was one of the, or the first investor that um, Cisco pitched, right? He declined and that's a whole story for a different day. Um, but under his sort of wing, he helped kind of shape our thesis in terms of how we approach venture capital. Um, and it's been a journey since then. So we created, it was actually my brother that decided that he, he my sister and I should hooey up together to create Salt and Ventures. And that is the venture firm that we run, um, based here in Hawaii. So I'm going to do a quick share screen, a bunch of slides, just share some of the work that we've done. 
Um, I don't really like talking about myself. So despite how long and rambled that was, uh, it was painful for me because I really kind of like to work. I, I like our work to be what we shine a light on, not uh, me personally. Uh, sometimes I'm told that's, you know, very mysterious and not a good thing and yada, yada, yada. I don't really care. I think the work speaks for itself or it should, right? I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have um, about me, about my journey. I'm not shy about sharing them. I just don't like to shine the spotlight on myself. That's not why I do this. Um, oh, by the way, if at any point you have questions, comments, uh, uh, want to want to take a jab like I can see Frank in the little smirk please feel free um, so Salt Adventures is a VC firm that we founded here in Hawaii it is uh, I'm excited and proud to say that uh, for over a decade we were probably one of the only firms that was taking 100% local dollars and investing it 100% into local entrepreneurs and companies. Uh, and that's not a knock against the thesis of other firms, you know, but we thought it was um, better or um, I'm trying to find the right words since this is recorded, right? Um, we thought it, did, it made more sense to use local dollars to support and elevate local entrepreneurs and startups. I'll just leave it at that, all right? There is uh, something to be said about cross-pollination and time and a place for that. And I'm a big supporter, big, big, big supporter of it. My background in and of itself is a cross-pollination and a confluence of different experiences. And so I think that's what um, helps me personally um, connect with so many of the different startups that we work with. So diving in. So along the way, we quickly decided probably day one, maybe day one and a half, that it wasn't enough to cut checks, especially in a place here like Hawaii, right? That we had to be much more hands-on and much more supportive in terms of helping nurture the growth of the companies here in Hawaii. Hawaii is a very special place. It's a very unique place. And the constructs and the infrastructure and the support mechanisms and the funding types that are necessary in order to create abundance here in Hawaii, those have to be different than what are on the continent or across the globe, period. Um, I definitely believe in place-based entrepreneurship. I definitely believe in place-based uh, financial uh, funding opportunities and so on and so forth, right? So we're investors, we're entrepreneurs. Uh, we've been called full stack ecosystem builders. Uh, we definitely wear an ecosystem building hat uh, in many, many, many of the things that we do. You can see here that we've been fortunate, um, both in terms of the companies that we're working with and the work that we've done here in Hawaii to be recognized locally and nationally several times for our different programs. We're very, very, very active in the community. That's by design. Um, and so along the way, we've created many different uh, events. Uh, we've created and um, run with other organizations, um, networking, talk stories, um, I mean, you name it, right? And I'll dive into some of these. And then, of course, we've invested millions, uh, millions of dollars uh, locally here as well. Um, in no particular order, one of the things, uh, Frank mentioned this, is ACI. Um, I always include this because I think it's a testament to the beautiful things that can happen when we as a community work together and we work with the things that are already existing, right? Uh, too often, let me step on a platform here for a second, too often uh, you see, that's a really nice thing. I'm gonna replicate it and do it myself over here. And I, I really, I'm not a big fan of that, right? That dilutes the effort of the organization or the individual that was running that thing instead of elevating them. Um, and so when and where possible, I think it's much better to connect and to elevate that work and incorporate it into the things that you're doing. And that was part of the things that happened with ACI. We worked with organizations like MEDB across the entire state to get people who were dislocated due to COVID, so they were out of jobs, and to help upskill, reskill them, and cross-skill them in new emerging and, and innovation industries. The program and the, the, the scaffolding that I created got approved by the ledge for 36 million and it got split into two lines of work, INA and conservation 
and then emerging industries and innovation. So two extremely important sort of focus areas, if you will, here in Hawaii. Uh, UN Foundation ended up doing an article about it, talking about how um, Aloha is delivering SDG progress in Hawaii, right? And um, it was a very, it was a very successful program. I think we eventually were able to reach all seven islands. So we had folks on Niihau working remotely for companies on some of the other neighbor islands. Um, I always bring it up because there's intention at the state and city and county levels across the uh, all the islands to um, redo this program, right? To run it again. Um, part of also, so it wasn't just meant for individuals. I think part of um, what I wanted to accomplish when I created the scaffold was that it would support businesses. And so the businesses that were creating space for these individuals to get cross-skilled were also supported um, financially. And so, you know, um, during these really hard times, the participants got um, medical insurance. And then um, the companies that were pre creating these um, opportunities for them got the help and ended up actually growing. Many of the companies, um, while their sister and brother companies were were closing, unfortunately, due to COVID, they were actually um, creating more revenue than they ever had in the past. Another program, just very quickly, it was the Oahu Small Business Resource Network. And so, you know, how can we create this multiplying effect um, with every dollar that we deploy um, so that when we deploy it into a company, it actually has a spidering effect and it helps to support other companies. And so we deployed about a million dollars, not we, um, and the million dollars wasn't from us, it was from city and county. All of this was using CARES Act funding, but we were helping run and administer it with uh, Oahu Economic Development Board so that we could support technical assistance providers who then were supporting other small businesses. Right. Along the way, we've changed the law a couple of times. Um, this allowed the University of Hawaii to actually invest and support um, their faculty as they spin out their innovations that they've been working on. Prior to uh, the work that we did with Accelerate UH, that wasn't possible. So imagine you're a researcher at the university, you create this awesome invention, and then you can't, you have to get another office, you have to get other equipment, you have to do all of this stuff, right? Which, you know, when you're a new startup, that's obviously not economically feasible 99% of the time, especially when you have equipment worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. This law actually allowed for some of those um, possibilities to start occurring. Um, I mentioned we we're active in the community. We also try to have fun with the community. So you can look at, at oh, sorry, you can see all the different things that we've done from UH Tech Showcases to Honolulu Fashion Week to Taste of Waianae to still probably one of my favorite things. We partnered with um, MEDB and uh, we did this, you know, two-day uh, boot camp on Lanai. Right. I think it was one of the first ones or only ones um, that has ever been done on the Lanai. And we worked with, with residents over there, you know, ideating and and um, sharing best practices, learning more about the things that they were working on. It was it was good fun. And then, of course, here, this was, again, another fun thing. You all know Uber, right? We did this on Maui and we did this here in Honolulu. So you you pulled up your Uber app. You called for an Uber, and if you were lucky enough, there was an investor waiting for you in the Uber, and you got to pitch them from point A to point B, right? So just fun stuff like that, again, to create engagements within the community. Um, we've done stuff. Um, is, this is actually in Istanbul. This is in Okinawa. I shared with a university over there and with the ecosystem over there, how to build an innovation ecosystem. Here, actually, you'll see me with the governor. This is, um, man, I'm just going to go for it. Um, this was a um, opportunity that we had where we, Amazon has these um, startup and investor teams, right? I'm blanking on the, the formal name of it. And usually they do these retreats in different tier one cities. Um, we worked with them, Joey, who was at Amazon. We worked with Amazon and with Joey to actually convince them to come out to Hawaii. It's the first time, and it might be the only time that they've ever gone um, to a non-tier one city to do their retreat, corporate retreat. 
And at the same time, we brought in local stakeholders, we brought in local companies. So again, that cross pollination can happen. And um, all these different investors from billion dollar companies and these founders of, you know, hundred million dollar companies could share and learn about our ecosystem here and also share about their journey. Here you can see uh, my brother Tarek talking at Steve Case's Rise of the Rest Summit. Rise of the Rest is Steve Case's sort of um, thesis in terms of supporting uh, startups outside of the traditional three hotspots, right? Like 80 or 90% of venture capital goes to Silicon Valley, Boston, and New York. I mean, 80 to 90%, it's crazy. Right. So he's doing, he does these roadshows with his revolution fund to other cities. Um, I'm going to fly through these next ones, right? We were asked to create a youth accelerator program that was investment backed. So providing funding to youth so that they can ideate and create their own sort of companies, small businesses, startups, whatever. They had the stuff that you normally see, like, you know, um, cookies and bags that are sustainable. So there's less plastic waste and baking. And then you had a 10 year old that was working on a carbon scrubber. And so he wanted to capture carbon uh, out of the air and reduce it down into these building blocks that they can use in developing countries to build sustainable houses. Um, I had to do a lot of research to keep up with him. It was pretty phenomenal, actually. I mean, he drew schematics and everything. Um, who was mentioning this in the beginning? Well, I think Laureen in our breakout room was asking. So uh, not having the option is terrible, right? Um, and so a lot of times anyone that wants to get into venture capital, have that exposure, startups, accelerators, all of that stuff, like very traditionally, it was uh, hard for them to get that type of exposure, right? And so um, completely within our own organization, with no outside funding, we created an internship and fellowship program so that anyone, regardless of age or background, who wanted to get exposed to that, who wanted to learn more about it, had that opportunity to connect, right? Had that opportunity to learn about it. And so we've had over 100 entrepreneurs come through when we, well, I used to say when we had offices come through our office doors right and work with us work with the startups etc it's been from high school ages to college to uh, phd candidates to doctorates to tech transfer um officers to mds i mean you name it like again for me um, and for my team and for our work it's really about eliminating barriers right and as much as possible creating those opportunities and then creating the pathways for those opportunities um in order for innovation to work anywhere so putting my ecosystem building hat on i truly believe there's a handful of things that need to happen right people need to have or should have the mindset so the entrepreneurial mindset the innovation mindset the creative problem solving etc they need to have the skill sets that go along with those, with that mindset, right? And then you need to create opportunities for them. A lot of times that's where it stops, right? And so what's missing? Access to those opportunities, right? And so when you create access to those opportunities, when you uh, create the pathways and the infrastructure to support the different companies and entrepreneurs as they evolve and grow in their journey of creating a company or being an entrepreneur, I think that's what leads to true, true transformation, right? Um, and so all of our work is around trying to, to support those four things. Of course, we don't do this alone. Um, if you haven't noticed, we partner with a lot of people, right? Um, we did a podcast. It was one of the top 100 podcasts. Again, it was about promoting uh, Hawaii-based businesses, creating national awareness. Um, when Tark showed up, Tark's my brother, when he showed up at Steve Case's Rise of the Rest Summit, he found a booth that featured our podcast. And we had, we had no idea that that was going to be there. So it was super, super exciting. I told him to take a photo. He did. And uh, this is what we got. In the second season, it was purely about um, minorities and women entrepreneurs and investors, right? So they're sharing their stories, their struggles, their accomplishments, et cetera, again, um, so that people um, are able to build the sense of community. Um, entrepreneurship's a lonely road. I'm going to speed it up. Prex is our latest thing. It was born out of um, COVID, right? We were planning on doing this program, COVID hit, and we realized everything's different. And so we quick, quickly changed 
um, the nature of the program. It's 100% virtual. It's four weeks. It's super intensive. It's about being investment readiness. Um, you can call it uh, a hyper-focused, hyper-intensive uh, program. It's meant to provide real-time assistance, right? So it's not the things that you would um, normally see, I suppose, in some of the other programs that are four, six, 18 months long. Like companies need rapid response. And so this program was meant to pro to attempt to provide that sort of rapid re response support. Um, just quickly about Prex, because my team will kill me if I don't share about it. It's been in five islands. Over 120 entrepreneurs. I think we're approaching 100 companies that have come through it. Um, again, this was formed in 2020. You can see the stats here in terms of uh, inclusivity, a huge cornerstone of our work. Here are the types of companies that we've worked with over the years to give you an example of the spread. Everything that we do is stage and sector agnostic. I know there's some other investors on the call. So, you know, seed or pre seed to Series A. You know, we're not out here cutting $25 million checks just yet, um, but hopefully one day soon. I do think that there is an investor on the call that does cut checks that size, but I'm not going to call them out. Um, so here's a, an example of our work. Kineticore, very local problem. It was born out of UH and Queens. This technology came about um, for a very sad reason. Um, it was a was a huge meth problem in Hawaii. And so there were a lot of babies being born who were already meth addicted. If you've ever had a head MRI, you know, once you get in this little closet, <laughs> you can't move. If you do, it blurs the image, right? And then, so you get diagnostics that look like this instead of looking like this. Better yet, here, if you move, if you can't stay still, this is what the images look like. And it costs hospitals just in the U.S. alone over a billion dollars. With the, with the Kineticore technology, this is what it'll look like. So, I mean, you want your radiologist, your doctor interpreting this to figure out what's wrong, if there's something wrong, or this. Um, here's another company, again, out of Jabsum. I, this, this is a tech ohana, so I, I chose some tech companies. Um, here you can see how do we teach uh, medicine in a way... Wow. Um, that is uh, culturally sensitive as well as, um, you know, allows for a view or in a perspective that you don't necessarily get in out of textbooks. And so you can manipulate it. You can actually take each jawbone apart. You can take, you can completely dissect the, the well, this is a skull, right? Um, virtually. Um, I'm not just an investor. I also support the companies. So here, whoops, this is a fun one. How do you play it? Right. Um, they asked, here's my little play button. I think my slide count is is uh is hiding it here. Well, it's worth actually showing. So hold on a second. Where's the little play button? Oh, it's not playing. So here actually was um, them dissecting my head. So they took my scan from Kineticore. So I went and I did a head MRI because I had a migraine for a nine weeks straight. Um, so they wanted to check me out. They took my, um, my scan and then they actually created this 3D model of it. And so they spin it around, they slice it, they dice it. Uh, unbeknownst to me, they were showing this video all across the, the nation. Um, it was a lot of fun. I'm bummed it's not actually playing. Uh, we do, um, we've supported technologies like this. So wastewater management, how do you take sewage and you turn it into gray water so that you can use for crops. This technology was actually used at a um, transitional homeless shelter. So you can see here uh, the company CEO, obviously uh, the mayor at the time, the governor, and, you know, different city and council members. So it was used um, in their toilet and shower system. And then the clean water was used for um, agricultural crops that they were growing and flowers and stuff in the area. Um, here's a cybersecurity company. So here's me with the crown prince of Dubai signing like uh, uh, LOIs and, and contracts and stuff. So we were able to land a contract with uh, the government of Dubai, specifically Dubai, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority. This was a cool cybersecurity play. Again, these are all Hawaii companies, right? 
where um, when you think about the protection they usually get, it's not at a chip level. So this was cybersecurity at a chip level. So you couldn't hack into somebody's camera. You couldn't hack into somebody's microphone because the, there was protection on a cipher that was contained on, on the chips. They wanted to use it for their drones, for their smart meters, for um, a lot of the advanced stuff that they were doing out there. There's um, natural resource solutions. So how do you manage natural resources that we have here in Hawaii? It's very important, right? And how do you digitize that? And then we have the, you know, they're all fun, right? But then you have like low tech stuff like this. So you have a female founder flying back from Japan. She's tired of her chopsticks rolling off the tray table. She creates a different type of chopstick with a rest in it, um, comes through our program, gets on Shark Tank. You can see them here all dressed up, having fun with it. Pitches the sharks, doesn't get a deal, but it gets an enormous amount of exposure. If you've ever seen this episode, they filmed part of it in our uh, office and we're like pretending to be students and she's an entrepreneurial uh, teacher, you know, professor of entrepreneurship and she's like teaching us. They're all over the islands. Uh, they're at Disney resorts. The, she's, she's doing really, really well. Um, we also have food products, right? So Uncle's Ice Cream. I'm not sure if this is on Maui yet. It might be, uh, but they are created ice cream sandwiches here. You can talk, you see sort of like um, the support that Prex was able to provide them. So they doubled their business, right? This is between 20 and 21. Um, they're actually opening up in Vegas as we speak. And they're doing a startup engine. So they're doing a crowdfunding campaign if you guys want to be owners uh, and investors in Uncle's Ice Cream. Uh, We've worked with a lot of companies across a lot across a lot of sectors, um, fashion, food, et cetera. Uh, as I mentioned, you know we're approaching 100 companies and pre-X. Um, these are kind of the foundational staples of everything that we do, mm -hmm. right? Building community and supporting that, um, providing capital, and of course the educational piece, right? Those skill sets and mindsets that are required in order for us to take advantage of innovation. Um, that's all I have in terms of screen sharing. That was longer than I anticipated, but I hope it was valuable for all of you in illustrating the wide and diverse, um, things that we've been working on here in Hawaii with our beautiful partners. Thanks a lot, Omar. Um, we'll open it up for questions now. Um, you can either write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera and ask your question. And uh, just identify yourself if you're gonna unmute and open your, uh, uh, turn on your camera. Hey, Omar, uh, Darcy Hughes here. Quick hey, question about your, your thesis. I won't get too inside baseball here, but uh, the founder first mentality, uh, how do you balance that with uh, investor relations and limited partnership chatter? It's tough, uh, especially if you um, are doing the traditional venture capital. Um, I've got you on two screens. I'm going to move you to one, Darcy. Right? Uh, if you've got, so the traditional stuff is, it's tough. And I don't necessarily agree with it, to be honest. I think it's really archaic. I think um, the funding mechanisms should bend over backwards to support the different uh, founders and entrepreneurs. Uh, you know just as well as I am that that's really nice to say, but really kind of hard to implement, especially when you're evaluated uh, as a VC on specific metrics, right? You've got your IRs, you've got your multiples, you got all of that good stuff. Um, it's very tough. And so it is constantly um, a conversation that happens. I think um, there is an understanding here in Hawaii that uh, the majority of the companies are not your traditional VC uh, shaped company. And therefore, if we actually are going to support the companies that are um, being birthed and growing here in Hawaii, then the funding mechanisms need to change. Sometimes you will find, um, hopefully this is answering your question, sometimes you will find that that pendulum swings too much, 
again, this is all my opinion, where now we're investing in things based on value and not actually uh, a sustainable business that can thrive and create good here in the community. It's really just about values and mission and that type of stuff, right? Which then starts starts to sound very much like a nonprofit. Um, um, but even nonprofits need to have a sustainable business model, right? And so what we try to focus on um, with, when you're looking at a Kineticora, right? Um, obviously that, that fits more in the traditional sort of uh, the MRI company VC mold. And then when you're looking at something like Uncle's Ice Cream, the wastewater management and stuff, you know, that gets a little bit uh, away from that traditional model. Um, so in our experience here, it's always been a conversation with the LPs. Sometimes we're more successful than others, right? But if we want to create change here, then we need to create the infrastructure that gets them uh, a little bit closer to uh, what a traditional sort of investment might look like. And even yet, I say I don't necessarily agree nine out of tens, ten times with that um, with that archaic model. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine the conversations that we have with my board chair. <laughs> this is a guy that's flipped, you know, has 74 portfolio companies that have IPO'd, right? So what are your thoughts on it? It's a balancing act, uh, 100%. I mean, you, you want to go after strategic money who believes in your thesis. So that's obviously the first filter. And if you get that right, then you can go ahead and clear the path for the founders, but it's it's definitely one of the hardest things I've, I've come across. And I do believe in your full stack methodology. So it's uh, it's gonna be interesting to to watch it unfold. It's a I challenge. appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, Vancouver, right? Yeah. So not a traditional hotspot, but no, uh, no lightweight either. There's a lot of cool stuff happening out there. Yeah, yeah, flying out of the gates. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away. Mm -hmm. Am I on? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Omar. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'm just curious because you seem kind of like you're a hub, a connector of entrepreneurs, but is there a platform or some sort of thing where we can connect with other entrepreneurs or learn about these cool companies that you shared today? Um, no, there is not, unfortunately. I think the best way to go about that is um, using the resources. That, I, don't, I don't know which island that you're on. So if you're on Maui, connecting with MEDB, well, uh, um, because um, they have those resources and connections already established, right? Uh, unfortunately, here in Hawaii, uh, there isn't like one-stop uh, platform where you can go and just get connected in. Um, it's one of the things that we're trying to solve for. Uh, unfortunately, like many other places, there is that, got to use the right two words. Um, if one person's interested in it, all of a sudden you get multiple people interested in it, and all of a sudden it's going a lot of places and nowhere at the same time, right? But there has been talk about trying to create a platform that kind of aggregates that. Um, there are, now it depends on what you're interested in, right? So I shouldn't say there isn't any whatsoever, but there are a couple of sites that try to aggregate specific sector type companies, um, which might be of, of use. But Short answer, reach out to MEDB, feel free to reach out to me. And yeah, if I can connect you with who or what you're looking for, I'm happy to do so. Awesome, thank you. Sure. I can see Chris's hands up, but I can also just see someone quickly a question in the chat. So I'm gonna ask that one first and then let um, then Chris ask his question. Yeah. So Omar uh, from Kwanzaa, what is the weakest link Hawaii in Hawaii tech infrastructure? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I think one of the weakest links in Hawaii's infrastructure, startup innovation in infrastructure period, is there is a lack of continuity, right? So mm -hmm. there is a lack of understanding in how long it takes to see the type of change that we all want to see 
and are trying to cause, right? With the different programs that we're running, the different companies that we're trying to grow, et cetera. And so uh, what you do is you get these uh, lots of sort of stutter starts, right? Like there's some, there's funding this year, but there's no funding next year. And then there's funding the year after that, but then there's no funding that, you know, that fourth year, right? And so there's lack of continuity and understanding that it takes, we need a five-year plan. We need a 10-year plan, right? We don't need a one-year plan. And so if there is a support for their infrastructure and for funding and for mentorship and for education um, and a desire to be educated, I think uh, that would go a long way. You know, Darcy asked me a really good question. Like, how the heck do you get the LPs to understand your thesis, right? Uh, many of them don't. Many of them don't. And I'll come back specifically to the tech part. Um, and I've heard countless times from some of the biggest players, like, that's really awesome, but we have this endowment and our goal is to grow the endowment, not to, um, you know, build an ecosystem here in Hawaii. And that's tough to swallow, right? And I don't know that it needs to be an either or. I think there, there's got to be ways. I know there's ways to do it so that it's a, a yes and rather than a, a no but or whatever. Um, for tech, um, I think there needs to be more programs that support uh, an understanding of what tech is and what it can um, cause or create. If you want to get ultra specific, I was part of a conversation with NSA and with uh, big tech, fir big firms here that hire tech folks, um, employees, trying to find the right word. Um, and I heard a lot of comments about people that they were hiring that have a master's in um, computer science and <laughs> have never written any code. So that's interesting. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so we're going to go on to Chris Mensel. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, hi, Omar. So, so nice hey, to meet you. In Likewise. I, I applied uh, to Pre-X. I'm, I'm uh, familiar with the name. <laughs> really fit in the group. Uh, so we're, we're planning to build a factory for mycoprotein and uh, basically cover the entire protein needs for Maui from that factory. I remember your application. And One of the things that I didn't mention, just to jump in, Chris, but you know this because we shared it with you, right? Is that as we run pre-X, it varies cohort to cohort, right? Yeah. Um, the things that we provide, right? And we look at the composition of a particular cohort um, and that composition changes. Sometimes we get companies that are heavy on the cybersecurity or heavy on um, uh, crypto, right? And other times we get company, a, a vast majority of companies that are more in the ag and food innovation space, right? And so as we get applicants and we look at that composition and whether or not it'll be a good fit because we want to create that community within it of support structure. It's a little bit different. I'm not saying it's super unique. And so um, and I don't know, we look at the stage of the companies for the cohort as well. But sorry, Chris, I just I forgot to mention that before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one question is, um, I'm, I'm sitting on Maui, so I don't know how much biotech is happening. Is there a way to tune into biotech in Oahu? Um, there's an okay amount of biotech. I don't think that, so a lot of times uh, this space, you talk about clusters, right? What are the biggest clusters um, that are growing here in Hawaii? And I don't know that anyone has really um, stood out more than another. Now, that's not to say that we don't have um, specific strengths, right? Regional strengths, I call them, right? There are specific areas where Hawaii is head and shoulders above the rest of the world. And so if we focus on those areas, we can definitely create uh, um, or shine a bright light on it and be a world leader in it. Um, biotech is an area where I think, depending upon the space specifically, uh, where that can actually happen. Um, but I don't think that there's been a lot of, no. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've run out of time. We're actually going over time at this point, uh, unless there's one burning question out there that you'd like Omar to answer. 
uh, maybe we could put it in the chat, give it to him, and uh, we can get back to you on that uh, at some point. So um, I think I'm going to pass it over to Annette so we well, can- I have, a, I have a final <laughs> comment, if you will, Frank. And okay, go ahead. Yeah, so when we think about technology and we think about um, how we can incorporate into things that we're doing, it, it's absolutely critical. I don't think that there is a single person out there that will say that technology is not important to economic development or diversification, two things that are very important and needed, not just here in Hawaii, but around the world, right? But how you use technology matters. And so for the longest time, efficiency, 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 that was just drilled into everybody. Right. And um, it was about cutting costs. It was about improving margins. It was about profit. It was about all that stuff. And what you see as a result of that is what we're currently facing when a pandemic hits. Right. You see those supply chain issues. There's no inventory. You have squeezed out any sort of margin of error. Right. And so resiliency wasn't one of the thing areas where tech was really looked at in growing, but instead it was at efficiency. And so now when you look at the different um, big corporations around the world for the first time, they're talking about how to use technology and innovation to create resiliencies, redundancies, et cetera, so that we don't have the same type of problems that we're all facing now in terms of containers are sitting over there or, or this or that or food getting to Hawaii, et cetera. So as you incorporate technology into the things that you're doing, I would encourage you to look at ways that you can build that and not just look at cutting costs and efficiency. Um, I, I mean, I, I just a thought here before we go into the next breakout. Um, be, besides the efficiencies and the resiliency, there's also this whole aspect of, you know, what is the place of science in society that's being questioned a lot nowadays, you know, um, in terms of uh, technology and its uh, impact on human life for the good and for the ill. So uh, that's a that's a whole and that that's a seems to be a real cultural issue right now happening happening in Hawaii. That's just a, uh, an aspect, especially in agriculture. Um, there's there's a lot of discussion in that regard. Since uh, Chris brought up biotech, that seems to be a real real issue for a lot of people in Hawaii. But I want to pass this over. Thanks, Omar. Great job. We're gonna pass it over to uh, Annette now. That we're gonna have a breakout session. Correct. Yes, and we'll just make you just being aware of time. Just have a quick breakout. Um, you'll be in some different rooms, and uh, just want you to just share your major takeaways from today's presentation. What have you taken away, and perhaps how you may apply it um, as you leave here in the next, you know, in the, in the short term or long term. So have a quick discussion on that, and then we'll come back here. Um, be open to sharing um, some thoughts um, with the group before we close out for the night. And there is a drawing at the end. So I'm going to open those rooms now. All right, welcome back. Everyone must have been deep in conversation. No one left their rooms early. Um, I'd love to hear from anybody to share, you know, what uh, a key takeaway, perhaps, a, you know, you found there were some mutual takeaways. Um, please, if you haven't spoken tonight, you know, put up your hand and share with the group. I'm sure Omar would love to hear from you. I'll go ahead. Thanks, Rhonda. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Rhonda from Maui, and um, I'm the owner of Kupa'a Consulting Services, and i um, I've followed Omar and his team for a few years now um, and continue to be inspired um, by what they offer and what they provide for community members like myself. Um, I've more recently been willing to step into the entrepreneur bubble and um, definitely um, it's super lonely. <laughs> it's a struggle. Um, and he and his team and offering the pre -ex and other resources that they have and um, has been inspirational and encouraging. And I appreciate him taking the time today to share some of the other companies and things that they've invested in. So thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Appreciate you sharing that and uh, wishing you the best with your entrepreneurial journey. Um, anybody else like to share? Um, we've had time for one more and then we'll do a drawing and um, close up for the evening. Yeah, this question is for Omar. Is, is, there, is there a technology that you are kind of like 
aching for and something that you'd like to see become innovated that you're not really seeing somebody serve? Interesting. My mind wandered because you said aching and I've had lower back pain for the last three weeks. So my mind instantly went there. I was just going to say that was a good choice of words. <laughs> um, yes, but I can't think of it right now. I mean, that's a good question. I Honestly, I do have two that I always chat about with my brother. Um, one of them we're working on, so I don't want to disclose that. But then the other one... Um, well, I I mean, I don't want it to be a uh, cop out answer, right? But I think we need I think we need innovation around the education space, like formal education, right? Um, and so I would love to see technologies being applied to that in ways that completely disrupt the education system here in the US. right? It's done very differently outside of the US. I'm not saying it's that much better. Um, but for sure, having gone through the U.S. education system, not a huge fan and still paying off debt. Um, there's a comment in the um, chat from Chris Mensel. It says uh, Hawaii should create a focus on industries where we can achieve leadership status. 100% Got to... agree. Yeah. But I think technologies that can help create um, better equity. Right, especially among the underserved and underprivileged, uh, Jonah, I think that would be really good. And again, you know, when it comes to education, like that's something that you carry with you for the rest of your life. And if you don't have the same access that others who are a little bit more privileged do, um, again, you're carrying that for the rest of your life. So technology that creates equity in the education space, I think would be really cool. Super. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you for those who participated in uh, questions and also in your breakouts. We, oh, before we do that, we do have a survey link. We do appreciate your feedback on the uh, the whole meeting. You know what was what worked. What can we improve upon so we continue to grow? And what kind of speakers do you want? So please give us that feedback. And that link is in the chat, uh, so you can fill that out. First of all, I didn't thank him enough, but I really want to thank Omar for his presentation today. I, as usual, it was his usual brilliant self. Um, even though he outed himself, he's been on his back for the last couple of weeks with extreme back pain. So we're actually uh, very grateful that he's here this evening and has taken the time to uh, uh, be with us today. So thank you, Omar, very much for being here. Uh, uh, from my vantage point, um, it's always inspiring to listen to you talk. And I also learn every time we have a conversation and, uh, and we make a presentation. I would also like to thank all of you who have attended today. Uh, you're was what make uh, Tekohana tick. And, uh, you know, I'm going to say this up front, but uh, I'm looking forward to having food and getting together again in person. So we're hoping we can put the, uh, the BA5 or whatever it is to rest and, and, and get us together again uh, in person uh, very soon. Uh, last but not least, I want to call out Annette Lynch and Leilani, Leilani Ventura. Leilani, can you open your camera, please? Okay, uh, so everybody can see you. Um, uh, these are the two that make this engine run smoothly. If you add, if you just relied on me, this, this would crash and burn. So, uh, I, I can voila, voila very good, but, uh, these are the two people who actually make, uh, the, the, the engine per. So we want to thank Annette and Leilani and the, the, the rest of the team at MEDB for all the hard work that they do, uh putting on uh, Tech Ohana and the webinars and everything that we do. So mahalo to the two of you and mahalo to everyone. So uh, let's close it there and uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully in person and with Kau Kau. So mahalo. Mahalo everyone. Mahalo Annette, Frank. <laughs>